afternoon. My name is Vanessa Hemovich, and I am an associate professor of psychology at the Japan Institute of Technology. And my research and the classes that I teach focus on cognitive science, uh, UX, UI, and a lot of ways that psychology dovetails with game design. And I'm really looking forward to giving this talk today and the role of schemas as a driving force, as we'll see, with perception, information processing, and decision making. So for today, I'm just going to sort of outline kind of where we're headed. And the, the idea of how is cognition relevant to game design is something that we're going to look at here. And I wish I had three hours to do a master class, but unfortunately, I only have about 20, 25 minutes. So I'm just going to sort of boil this down. And schemas have a, a very... Uh, a very complicated relationship with human behavior. And they are easily formed, easily activated, and never really turn off. And today we're going to explore the nature and the relevance of schemas to player behavior, and how and why they function to drive player perceptions, and how they guide decision making, and things like player choice. So what is a schema? This is a good place for us to start. And one example of this um, is obviously what you see here, um, this nice cute little puppy dog. And in research, a schema is defined as an organized mental structure or representation of stimuli. And schemas really do work to streamline our information processing and categorize objects to help them relate to one another. General categorizations like this can more or less be considered universal. This is a picture of a dog, not of an airplane, and schemas tend to reside in our long-term memory. That said, one more complicated aspect of schemas is their subjective nature. So if I had everyone in the audience close their eyes and imagine the concept of a dog, we would see a lot of variety in this room. I might picture a German Shepherd, and you might think of uh, Snoopy or something like that. So in terms of looking at schemas in action, what we can see here is that when we first learn, often when we're young, what a dog is, a schema is formed. And this is called assimilation. And this is a process of fitting information that contains the features we associate that defines this stimulus. So for example, a dog typically has two ears, a tail, four legs, and tends to bark. And when we are out about and about in the real world, we see these stimuli. And we carry forward what we've assimilated in long-term memory with us. Is this a dog? Does it match the known criteria? In this case, the answer would be yes. So over time, what we do is we learn that life can get complicated, and schemas evolve and develop into more specific and hopefully more accurate mental representations. And this is referred to as accommodation. And it allows mental frameworks to adapt and progressively change from simple concepts to more complicated representational concepts like this. So we learn that schemas, or dogs in this case, contain a bit of variety. And our mental frameworks adapt. And by the way, we are doing this our entire lives. This is not just something that children go through as they learn and grow. Devs experience, invoke, and change their schemas. So do artists and programmers. Um, players do as well. Really, nobody is immune. So in cognitive science, what we do is we sort of work through schemas and activate them in different ways. And one is through what's called conceptually driven schemas, and this is known as top-down processing. So here we see Homer deliberately <laughs> invoking his mental framework of bacon, which of course is delicious, and I hope you're all not thinking about bacon and can instead stay with me here as I continue to talk about schemas and not talk about bacon. And strategy is another good example of this as well. So with top-down processing in a game, let's say, like Rocket League, what happens is what's called endogenous thinking. And players learn strategy quickly. And they learn best practices and procedures uh, to use these strategies, use this knowledge to inform how to play the game. For example, you should not really, in a game like Rocket League, send more than one teammate into the initial strike. You'll want to also maybe think about dividing the field and only uh, well, watch the risk in terms of chasing the ball. Don't bunch up and, and keep the ball centered maybe if you're going for a more aggressive strategy. Personally, I find that the best offense is a good defense. And if you disagree with me, I look forward to meeting you in the arena. Schemas are also activated sometimes purely from a sensory level, or when the environment delivers a stimulus sort of at our feet. And this is more of a what's called data-driven type of processing. And here Homer is sort of minding his own business, and he happens upon the cola machine. He might not have been thinking about this attitude object before, but he definitely is now, and it may even change or alter his behavior. And for those in this room who have maybe experience playing Fortnite or other battle royale games, what tends to happen is sometimes the environment is so intense that player strategy just goes right out the window. I'm gonna drop into this zone, 
no, there's 30 other players that are here. Now what do I do? Now where do I go? And here the environment is telling the player what's going on. And what they might get into is a little bit different than what they might have expected. And they need to prepare themselves for what's coming. So sometimes players have to adapt their strategy based on how the game is going. And schemas are what shoulder this burden for us. Schemas allow us to shift between top-down processing and bottom-up processing and meet the demands of the game. So mentally, there's an app for that, and it's called a schema. So in other games, and I'm using Destiny here as an example, we oftentimes refer to on strategy-based schemas for planning, and the more that you are aware of these schemas, the better you're going to play. But that doesn't mean that players won't also be interested if something does sort of pop up in front of them, like a golden treasure chest or a loot crate. And there are things that will inform the player that they're close at the environmental level. It could be a sound cue that they're getting close to something that might be interesting or worth checking out. So one question that I always pose to my students is, is it possible for schemas in terms of top-down and, uh, and bottom-up processing to coexist and truly be simultaneous? And if we think about it, the answer is yes. It is possible. Knowing strategy and the schemas around that is a good thing. Being open to the demands of the environment and sort of knowing that we should react to what the game throws at us is also a good thing. So you may start with one strategy, the game throws something else at you, and schemas allow us to adapt and shift between these different types of combinations of mental processing. So games are not only able to do this, they are notorious for doing this. In the case of what we have here, Robo Recall, there are plenty of game examples where devs absolutely throw a wrench in the plans of the best laid strategies that players have. The player understands where to go, the checkpoint is here, the game has informed them, it could be a, a narrator, a narration, it could be an NPC. And they already know where they have to go. Unfortunately, enemy agents arrive on the scene, they're probably blocking the path, and the player is forced to sort of accommodate and use that environmental input in a way moving forward. And this is schema accommodation. I have a plan, but the game world did something else. So this is uh, one thing that I wanted to kind of highlight with this presentation. Another one is how do we predict what players are going to attend to? People are complicated, and so are their perceptions. But the good news is that science has repeatedly shown us that we can, to a large extent, predict certain aspects of human behavior. And one way is to invoke schemas that will guide information processing through what's called conceptual fluency. And in terms of understanding player perceptions and predicting those perceptions, conceptual fluency is one of those things that's all about invoking schema consistency and designing game elements that rely sometimes pretty heavily on how to navigate the game world and wrestle with stimuli and adapt their strategies. So players have a long history, as you can see, with certain icons for schemas, and we build game icons around those perceptions that can and should be easily recognized. And when we do recognize them, what happens is it aligns with what we know and what we expect. And it's automatic, information processing is easy, and it feels good. And really, this is now sort of getting into the domain of uh, UX versus UI, which I don't have time to talk about today. But I wanted to just sort of introduce this concept here, because we are going to circle back to it. So let's consider an example of how, let's say, a typical player would interact with something like a game menu. And the new game is generally listed at the top of the menu with exit at the bottom. And that's a schema that I think every single person in this room probably has. And when those puzzle pieces click together with what I know and what I experience, this generates conceptual fluency. Here is another example from the Witcher series, and you can see, again, we have a relative match. That new game is listed at the top, and exit or quit is at the bottom. Here is yet another example where things are aligning. And in all three instances, the mental rule is in place, and we have a schema match. Information processing is easy, everything is as expected, and cognitive load is relatively light. However, what sometimes happens is schemas don't always match to their environment. Here, suddenly, there is a mismatch with this rendering, and easy and automatic thinking is momentarily disrupted. And as the player is asked to accommodate to this new arrangement, that violates some of their prior expectancies. And cognitively, we have to work just a little bit harder, just a little bit. This creates what psychologists call conceptual disfluency. And conceptual disfluency leads to something called attentional blink. 
So when schemas are violated, mentally we often have to pause. Orange juice and chocolate chip cookies is not in my wheelhouse. My students say, go on, you should just try it. I'm not having it, I'm not gonna do it. It's, it's too much for me. I don't have time to tell you what's wrong with this combination, but it's not a good one for me. And when the disfluency is too strong, what happens is we reject it. Uh, here's another exam example of my students. Um, they send me emails and they say, just go for it. And again, I'm not, I'm not having it. It's feel free to do as you see fit. I don't want to hear about it. So with conceptual disfluency is another example, again, from my students. This is something called Cage of Thrones, which is just a Google click away. And most of the major characters from Game of Thrones are photoshopped with the head of Nicolas Cage on instead. And to each their own. The thing about Cage of Thrones that's interesting is that Nicolas Cage doesn't really belong in Game of Thrones at all, and it creates a very profound attentional blink. And this, what's especially interesting is that these characters are so iconic that if you put your hand sort of over the head of this character, you could probably identify who it is. And audiences don't even need to see their faces. This hairstyle alone is <laughs> enough of a cue to invoke a mental representation of a certain character, and we see Nicolas, Nicolas Cage's face instead. And by the way, to be clear, Cage of Thrones is an equal opportunity Photoshop endeavor, and no woman, man, or child who has a leading role in this series is uh, particularly safe. I just happened to pick two characters here uh, that, are, that are popular, and there are plenty more. And it's perfectly fine to laugh when there is conceptual disfluency, but the point to remember is that there's a schema violation, and we do recover from them, and they can be interesting, but what happens that I hope that you would focus on is that there's a shift from automatic processing to a more controlled type of cognitive processing. So getting back to games, as an example, oh, I'm sorry, uh, with Mario, is that some of you may recall in Mario Odyssey, there was a bit of a, a slight wardrobe change. Uh, I'm not sure if I can say the word nipplegate, but I'm saying it. Uh, chest Goombas was also another um, reference point for this. Poor Mario. I mean, Mario deserves to have nipples, doesn't he? He's, he's, he's an iconic character, and this look generally had um, one of two reactions, and players did respond in a certain way that sort of violated their expectancies of, of the traditional norm of this franchise. And attentional blink shifts our thinking, oftentimes to a more deliberate and systematic type of thinking. And controlled analytical evaluation oftentimes will require consideration. We can move from automatic processing to something else. Now, science also shows us that we can predict human attention. So it should be no surprise that there are ways to study knowledge uh, formation through schemas. And again, it is our schemas that really do wield uh, the power for us to do this through something called cognitive mapping. And these are schemas that players create often very quickly and revolve around their preferences or perceptions across spatial environments. They guide and inform player decision making and information processing. And they can be automatic. Sometimes they do require a little bit more deliberate or controlled thinking. And in the case here of uh, Titanfall, this is a bit of an older image now, but still relevant, players are using their schemas to navigate their game spaces to help them understand streamlined thinking, where they are, where they need to go, and what might be in their way. So for a game like this, I understand that I can uh, jump or parkour my way from point A to point B, and through this exact route, that's how I'm going to get there. If we wanted to give somebody in this building directions to the movie theater, you would go down the L, uh, escalator. We would invoke, uh, invoke uh, route mapping. You take a left outside the door, you cross the street, and I'm totally making that up. I don't know my way around this city at all, but you get the general idea that we could give somebody directions through this type of schema processing. Now, another way that we see players sort of wrestle with information is through a topographical map, maybe in the mind's eye even abstractly about where they are in terms of distance and landmarks and territories. So if I'm at ground zero in the case of this game Fallout, how far am I from Diamond City? And players ask themselves these questions internally all the time. How long will it take me to get there? And game maps help players to solidify these working schemas about their environment. So through survey mapping, sometimes it really is advantageous to, or even critically necessary, to hand players that topographical map. 
And just please be aware that the research is starting to show that some players have preferences and they prefer to learn through route mapping while others have a tendency to sort of lean more towards survey mapping in terms of understanding their environment. It's a lot like some people are more kinesthetic learners, some are more audio and visual, and the data is starting to show that this also seems to be the case for um, processing information at the game level through these types of maps. Now, in either case, there's a clear benefit to encourage players to map their environment and generate strong spatial uh, frameworks around their schemas. So in the case of Overwatch, where is the choke point? Is that going to be the best place to put my team? How many can fit over there? Are we too exposed? Where's the best vantage point? And cognitive maps really do align with environmental data. And like something like Google Maps, they update regularly based on player experience, time, and knowledge. So we are accommodating our schemas uh, pretty much our entire life. In games, there have been a few examples where player mapping is not really supported. This is um, one reason why something like Mapstalgia uh, came along, and I encourage you all to check out this website. It's fascinating. This is where players reconstruct mental maps of games that they've played entirely from memory. And I think some people cheat a little bit here and there, but the level of detail is pretty impressive. And it also demonstrates the longevity of these mapping schemas that we have. And especially when they're tied to strong emotion, in this case, nostalgia, the, the ability to draw upon that prior knowledge um, is fairly strong and it's also easy. I particularly encourage you to check out the Resident Evil, Evil map that's in Mapstalgia because it is absolutely fantastic and the level of detail is really, really good. So going back to examples where games sometimes don't support this ma uh, mapping procedure, um, for me personally, when I'm playing Dungeon Master, it can be a little bit more difficult to do because the player could create a mapping schema, but it's not really supported. There, the walls all look the same, the corridors left and right are very similar, and mapping schemas can form, but it's not easy. Today, we seem a little bit more able and willing to help players with their mental map schemas early on. In fact, now our players expect it, and they expect it to be done well. And this isn't a terrible idea, but we have to be very careful with our mapping not to push it too quickly with players. We need to, in the case of route mapping, give them enough time to get their hands dirty in the environment and explore, because that's how something like route mapping occurs. And if we just throw them instant teleportation or the epic ride too early, that can be potential missed opportunities for them to really sort of um, get down and dirty with the game environment and assimilate these schemas about space and ability to travel and how long of a distance is between point A and point B. Now, one of the last topics that I just have um, barely enough time to highlight here in the interest of time is, again, the predictive utility of schemas for knowledge formation. So as an example here, I have six chairs. And this is a concept known as category judgments. We engage in stimulus recognition when comparing what is known with what we encounter. And we make these category judgments all the time, all day. This is one reason why our brains get so tired. And here is a very simple stimulus with the example of a chair. So, I think just about everyone in this room can agree that there are six chairs on the screen. This is not some psychological trick. Sometimes my students think that I'm trying to pull one over on them. But we have a schema for office chair and rocking chair. We also have preferences. My personal preference is the chair on the bottom row in the middle. I love those chairs. They're so ergonomic and they're great. I'm thinking you can probably guess which chair is the favorite of my students, and I will give you a hint. It's in the top row and on the far left, and that is one repeatedly that they enjoy sitting in. Now, we might be surprised to find that top, right, uh, top left chair in a game like the Stanley Parable. Well, it's the Stanley Parable, so maybe um, that's a bad example. But we have these models for recognition based on the schemas that we find appropriate for them. And these category judgments can uh, really be useful in terms of knowledge prediction. So again, getting back to games. One way that these, uh-oh, uh, OK. So one way that these manifest is through what are called template or feature matching schemas. And in Minecraft, players develop a very um, very efficient working model or mental rule of thumb that you need exactly three stone blocks and two wood sticks. And with template or feature matching, typically it's a cookie cutter recipe that only a certain combination of objects will get you to sort of the end game here for what you need to do in the game. Skyrim is another example of this uh, with the golden clock where the task for players to complete 
is um, based on a template, and the game hints at what will match. And if there is a match, the content unlocks. And again, only this combination will do it, or a uh, number or correct order of things. In games like Riven, a personal favorite of mine, or um, even Monster Hunter, or any game that sort of throws a wanted poster at players, invokes a very specific cognitive schema based on distinct features. And what players will do, and we can predict this pretty robustly, is they will compare the schema in their mind with what is sort of thrown at them in the game. Is it a match, yes or no? And if the answer is no, we can predict to a fairly uh, strong degree that they will ignore it or even uh, outright avoid that stimulus. And these schemas are activated so, so quickly. It's, it's almost impossible to see. And uh, we can study it through brain imaging, but the point is, is that these schemas really do propel behavior forward or uh, backwards. I don't want to approach that thing, or uh, maybe, in fact, I do. Now, these types of um, sort of ways that we work through different uh, environmental stimuli, uh-oh, there we go, can also manifest through what are called recognition by component schemas. So schemas help us find to uh, find the basic building blocks of the things that we encounter in the everyday world. And I'm all kinds of confident that if I didn't have the reference points on the far left, that you could sort of disentangle that messy stimulus or stimuli that are listed uh, on the right. And the world is messy. Game environments are messy. They're challenging. They're complicated. And through these schemas, we have the ability to sort of uh, break things down to their, their base levels and, and repair them in our mind's eye. And it's a little bit more cognitively taxing, but we can do it, and it is, in fact, um, quite possible to do so. So with that in mind, we are able to, when we encounter things in a game, uh, see, uh, let's say, for example, these two models here. And these two objects we can understand through um, sort of our prior knowledge. These are, these are the basic building blocks of the halo rings or a, uh, a train that is um, not feeling so good in Fallout. In fact, a good horror game, and Limbo is a nice example here, will often take advantage of player schemas, especially in this way. And we don't have to show our entire hand. And that's the beauty of using these schemas to really inform game design. Because a partial cue is enough, and schemas will fill in the box for us. They will take over. And it, particularly in reference to monsters, players don't even need to see the, the entire object in order to understand the danger that's involved, as you see here. Devs, artists, and designers often allude to this, and they're invoking this type of recognition by component schema without really knowing what to call it. And we can do this with sound, we can do this with light, it doesn't have to be a purely visual stimulus. We can use these to sort of invoke activation thresholds and imply through a sound cue that gets stronger, you're getting very close to the loot crate. And we don't have to show them the entire thing. A, a change in light will sort of guide players one way. You're nearing the end of the maze, but you're not quite there yet. And while schemas are very good for encouraging certain player behaviors, they're also very, very efficient for other things as well. And one of them is to help them establish characters or even entire storylines. So one way that this manifests, <coughs> excuse me, is through what are called configural models. And through these schema models, as you can see in the case of Assassin's Creed, as long as the deviation isn't too far, and I'm thinking now of um, poor Mario again, the idea of the mental model in, in the case of Assassin's Creed with this protagonist is that sort of every game, every, every new game in the series, there's a little bit of a change, but it's relatively the same. There's always the, the cape and cowl, and there's some type of gauntlet, and there's usually boots involved. So these characters are iconic, and we accept that they change over time as the series changes over time. But Batman can never have a, a red cape like Superman, and neither one of them is really allowed to ever wear overalls, unless Superman is back at home in Smallville. I guess that wouldn't be a total deal breaker. But when deviations steer us too far from the established prototype, players oftentimes will say, no, that's enough. It's, it's orange juice and chocolate chip cookies. I'm not going to do it. And it is rejected as a concept. In the case of Elite Dangerous, clearly what we have here are configurable models that help to uh, communicate to the player that there are different achievements. And they still look simple enough to the achievement prototype, but clearly these are different. And the overall concept is still easily understood and not too much of a challenge mentally. A more complicated example is what you see here with Overwatch and other games as well. These configurable models may need a little bit more explanation 
But at the end of the day, the achievement schema model that players have assimilated, it still sort of is with them in their backpack. And it ma maintains fairly good consistency over time as the achievements increase. The design changes a little bit, but players are still able to accommodate these changes and really sort of uh, go with it. Again, in the, in the interest of time, there's a lot of other things that I could say, but I sort of need to um, wrap this up here. I hope that I've been able to share just a few ideas about how schemas do manifest themselves in games, and I'm gonna leave you with a few key points here. One is that schemas are very, very important to help us understand what it is that players are doing and predict how they are going to work with the information that we throw at them. Onboarding, attentional focus, this is obviously a huge domain to explore, but I would hope that you would consider them from the perception of schemas, because schemas really do play a very important role. And it is okay to violate those schemas. In fact, it's pretty fun to do it and twist players' expectations. And again, I'm thinking of the Stanley Parable. It's just on my mind today. But we have to be very careful with this because what can happen is an over-reliance on different types of thinking. And they are more systemic, deliberate, and more controlled types of thinking. Sometimes we want players to be on autopilot because that's a really fun way to throw a wrench in their plans. And if we are violating their schemas too often or too hard, uh, that can really cause a problem. A flow is an automatic cognitive process and schemas are very much within that realm of flow and help players to achieve flow. There's a few golden rules with flow that some of you may know. We need clear and immediate feedback, minimal distractions and so on. But in terms of schemas, I'll just present sort of one final point here. If you want to virtually guarantee the absence of flow in your game, it's really easy to do. All you need to do is place your players under heavy cognitive load because what happens is that is demanding that the player activate schemas to sort of keep up and change and accommodate. And the point that schemas help players the most is when they are trying to reduce cognitive load. And if we invoke them too hard, the task becomes too difficult. And we want players to be boosted in their ability to sort of work with new content. Too much stop and think will also get in the way of that process, and automatic schema activation is absolutely one of the keys to flow. Experience also seems to matter, and we can think about chess, where controlled thinking and strategy is super important, and sometimes players have to work at that level, but as they become good, it becomes an automatic process. But at the end of the day, loss of immersion does happen when players stop, and they have to ask themselves, what am I doing? and where am I going? And controlled cognitive processing is not bad, but when we are interrupted, when there is uncertainty, when we don't know what's going on, there's a change of shifting from controlled, uh, sorry, from automatic to more controlled types of thinking. Controlled thinking is not bad, it just is not the optimal condition in which to invoke flow. So I hope this talk has been informative. I am really glad to see psychology manifesting its way into games and games design kind of a, a, a bigger level. I think the summit is fantastic. And if you aren't on board with psychology, it's fun and it's not scary. And um, you should join us. We have cookies. Uh, we probably don't have orange juice, but um, <laughs> there's plenty of things that we can um, still explore. So I think we have just a few minutes. If there are any questions, I'm happy to address those. We're going to get kicked out in a minute or two. Um, if there are no questions, thank you. Uh, yeah, first of all, that was an amazing talk. Uh, second of all, uh, something popped into my head when you were talking about route mapping versus survey mapping. Mm -hmm. I wonder what your thoughts were on how The Legend of Zelda Breath of the Wild treats its map, because it seems like there's a lot of both route mapping and survey mapping in that, and yes. it does let you play around a little bit and get your hands dirty? There are a lot of things to say about that particular game. One is that it is an example that attempts to sort of hit the mark for, I, I'll just say both player types that tend to really enjoy route mapping and then others that prefer survey mapping. And they're kind of throwing everything in the kitchen sink at the player and letting the player decide, which I think is fantastic. Um, I don't know how effortful that thought process was in designing that concept, but it seems to be working. But for some players it doesn't, really work at all. So how on, I say this to my students all the time, how on earth do I make a game that's going to make everybody happy? And they seem to be hitting the mark enough, and it seems to be working enough. Um, I look forward to the day when we think of the different schema preferences from the prototype stage, from, from the first stage. 
that partially answers your question. Thanks. And I'm happy to talk after, by the way. Hi. Uh, speaking of schema subversions, like in Stanley Parable, mm -hmm. um, are you aware of any sort of research or work being done into seeing how games can work to help people um, challenge or rethink the, the schema that they, that they have outside of the time that they play games, you know, uh, the so schema about the world or, or themselves or society. Beyond the game environment, yeah. pro-social gaming. Right, right. There are a lot of pro-social games right now being um, created and pro-social research utilizing games. I don't think we're quite there yet, but we're getting very, very close. And um, if you would uh, like to become a cognitive psychologist and help us with this endeavor, that would be fantastic because <laughs> these are the questions that are now being started to uh, kind of revolve around the community. And I certainly don't claim to know all of the research, but the pro-social side of gaming seems to be very high level right now, which is great. Um, and you're talking about something that is distilled down. Um, we will get there. We're just not quite there yet. Okay. Thank you. Hi. Um, when you cre are creating a new system and say you find that it's sufficiently distant from existing mental schemas that it causes a lot of this dissonance and all these problems, uh, do you generally find, assuming you can't stack it directly on top of those schemas, that it's better to get close and have those exceptions be a little bit outside the norm or to go a little further out and have the person have to create new models for that entire thing? That's a wonderful question. Uh, Dark Souls comes to mind, just off the top of my head. You're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead, you're dead. Uh, some people responded very well to that. Others needed a bit more time to adjust. Um, sure, Stanley Parable, we've completely violated expectancies. I think the important follow-up to that is how we design after the fact. Because sometimes we just go for the punch of, this is totally not what you expected. And then what? Um, I think that's an important consideration to take into account. I love a good schema violation. It's better to maybe start a little bit smaller, but sometimes devs will come out swinging and it can kind of go one of two ways. Um, know your audience is important and um, good UX research will also help you get there, I will say. Right, an thank excellent you. question. Yes, thank you. Hi. Um Oh, I'm too short. <laughs> um, so I'm worried that this is too similar to the last question, but I was wondering, um, is there a way to overwrite existing schemas um, without causing schema discomfort, or at least a minimum amount of schema discomfort? And if so, what, how would you go about that? I would like to think that hopefully I converted one or two people in this audience that psychology is really cool and applies to games. So if I've won even one person over, I'm happy. Uh, that's a fairly easy example. Uh, to follow up on your question, reinforcement is really valuable because if the player is encouraged to think a different way, it's a little bit harder for us cognitively to do it. It places a little more cognitive load on us. But if the rewards are there, and I don't mean a carrot on a stick, it could be an intrinsic motivator, it could be group-based, um, that's a really efficient way to sort of encourage players to keep a more open mind. Um, and it's, it's a, that's a very large question, but um, reinforcers come to mind as kind of a, a big helping hand with that. Thank you. It's a great question. Yeah. Hi. Um, so first of all, thank you. Mm -hmm. And uh, I have two questions, which I think will have the same answer. But uh, one is that was a lot of information really fast, and yes. my hand hurts from trying to take notes. Yes. So where can we go to learn more? And also, uh, I'm a consultant for companies that don't usually think about games. And so it, part of what we do is go out and try and find uh, evidence that we can use to back up our designs from ethnographic research to other examples in the industry. And so this is why they might have the same answers. Like, what would you recommend looking at to help justify using some of these ideas? Well, I do know, or I would hope that because this is being recorded, this talk should be made available in the vault. That would be my hope. Um, the slides will also be made available as well. If anybody can't wait, I'm happy to um, email you the PowerPoint slides uh, at any point. So um, that's certainly an option as well. And the second part of your question was? Um, where, what are, well, actually, you kind of just answered that as well. But uh, the first part was actually, where could we go to learn more, like dig more into this? Oh, uh, well. 
UX is gathering momentum, UI, research, psychology, sort of these two fields are colliding, which is great. We have the traditional academics who study schemas that are just now starting to sort of transition into applying this more to games. So you're a little bit, uh, we collectively are a little bit ahead of the curve here, which is fantastic. But um, in terms of a book, I, I will direct you to Celia Hoden's wonderful book on... Supposing we've already ordered yes, that. Uh, that is a very, very good resource. Uh, we need a million more books like it. Uh, one just on schemas would be a very large volume. So the research is getting there. The academics are coming. Um, but right now, a, a good Google search is probably your, your best bet. Um, always, um, you can feel free to email me. I'm happy to sort of give specific resources for more specific types of questions, and I can sort of wade through that research. Um, I do that a lot for people who get in, get in touch with me. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Yeah. All right. I think we're going to get kicked out of here, so um, feel free to um, come talk to me, and thank you for coming. <laughs>